Welcome to worship as we gather on this, the 17th weekend of Pentecost. For those of you who are here in person, we're grateful for your presence. If you would like to participate in communion and you did not bring bread or wine, there is some available in the entryway. And for those of you who are joining us online, we are grateful that you are here. Make sure that you uh, indicate your presence via the chat function. Our theme for today is actions speak louder than words. We'll begin with the prelude. I would invite those of you who are present with us tonight to please stand for the opening song. I'll just ask you to uh, sing in your head. We, we still are not allowed to sing publicly together. Those of you who are online, please feel free to join in as we sing, Send Down the Fire. Give 
us righteous souls till your justice rolls. Make us burn with the fire of your truth. Send down the fire of your justice. Send down the rains of your love. Come send down your spirit, breathe life in your people, and we shall be people of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and our failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. the poor and powerless, all the lost and lonely, all the thieves will come confess, and know that you are holy. And know that you are holy And all will sing out hallelujah And we will cry out hallelujah mm -hmm. to our content and all who feel unworthy and all who heard with nothing left will know that you are holy will know that you are Tell it to the masses. 
The first reading this evening is from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. No, that all lives are mine, the life of the parent as well as the life of the child. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they, sure, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Then turn and live. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm for today is Psalm 25. Spirit 
The second reading today is from Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you enabling you both to will and to work for his good measure. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Those of you here present with us tonight, please stand for the gospel verse and reading. Send me, Lord, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, lead me, Lord, lead me, Jesus, lead me, Jesus, lead me, gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, you, O Lord. Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. Now, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. 
The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. You all may be seated. Good evening, everyone, and I, uh, I love to hear the sound of kids and babies, and I'm so grateful for that um, this evening in the sanctuary, and so um, thank you for those that are here tonight. Well, I'll tell you, tonight we're looking at a pretty big word, so I brought my whiteboard tonight and my marker, and I thought that I would write this huge word on the board. And so I'm going to write it. The word is repentance. Oh dear, I'm running out of room. Hmm. Maybe I better try it on this way. I better change directions. Repentance. I'm still not making it. I know. Maybe this way would be the best direction to write it. Repentance. Almost. So, (laughs) plan ahead, right? (laughs) But this word is a big word, and it's a pretty big deal. It is a pretty big deal. If you have ever had an opportunity, or have you ever had a word that came out of your mouth that wasn't helpful, and it wasn't kind, or you did something that was probably not a good choice, and I would bet that some of you would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry mom or dad, or I'm sorry to your brother or sister or friend. So we say we're sorry. Well, this word This big word, repentance, goes just a little bit further. And what it means is for us not only to be sorry, but to change directions, to change our behavior a little bit. So I brought something that you probably have, for my young friends, have no idea what this is. It's an atlas. (laughs) It's, you have a GPS. We all even, we all use the GPS. They're even in our cars. But this is a paper, yeah, paper atlas. And when we go on trips, or I want to find out where to go to find a different city or visit a friend, we would take out an atlas, or you take out your GPS. But you'd start on the road, and this is the United States, But even in Michigan, I have friends that live in Traverse City. And so I would take my Michigan map, but you know what happens sometimes? I take the wrong turn. And I'd I'd go down the wrong road in the wrong direction. So I'd have to get this map back out, and I would have to look to see how I could change directions to get where I needed to be. And so, friends, the word repentance, repentance, we're going to see if we can fit it on, is a very big word, and it's a big deal. And it means when you start to go down the wrong path, or maybe you've already taken the wrong turn, then you may change directions under and repent. Repentance. Very big deal. Amen. Amen. Send me, Lord, send Send me, me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me,
I don't know about you, but for me these days seem to confront me with so many large issues. A pandemic, forest fires, violent city streets, unjust treatment carried out by the power structure and endured by the power structure, frequent and increasingly intense floods and hurricanes, racism, its effect, and its reality. In some ways, at least to me, it all seems overwhelming. And at times, I have to be honest with you, I feel crippled. Is there anything I can do? Do I have any responsibility for what has occurred? Am I or are we together at all liable for what is going on? Or are we just the victims of what people and generations before us have passed on to us? If these kinds of struggles or questions resonate with you, then the book of Ezekiel is going to speak to you today. This book addresses people who are feeling overwhelmed. They are the first exiles who were forced to leave Israel in 597 BCE when the evil Babylonians began the process of occupying Israel. And Ezekiel was probably one of those exiles. These are folks who had to pack up and leave home. And many of them were Israelites who struggled to remain faithful to God in the past, and especially right now in their new, strange, unwanted homeland that they had to call Babylon. But life was a mess, and they felt hopeless about changing anything. It was all too much. They weren't able to make a difference. The generation before them had sinned big time, and they were living in light of what had been passed on to them. It was true. The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, this proverb, as strange as it may seem, was being used by the exiles to explain things and also to reduce the exiles' sense of responsibility for what had occurred. And more than that, for what they could do about it, to change the situation, to do what we in the church call repent. The proverb says that the parents have done something that has had impact upon the children. The parents eat sour grapes, and the children's no, children note it in their mouth, on their teeth. God says through the exiles, or excuse me, through Ezekiel, that the exiles are not to use that parable anymore because it is stopping them from the repentance that will bring life to them. Now, I have to say that this notion of the impact of a previous generation on a current one is not something worth discarding. Frankly, the Bible itself speaks of the sins of the parents being visited upon the generations to come. Trauma theorists these days are suggesting that trauma may actually alter the DNA of people who have endured the trauma, affecting generations to come. Generational curses can be very very real. Studies of the victims of the Holocaust and slavery reveal that truth. And the systems theory advocates will help you see the impact of the system that goes back in time on you and the way you live. The systems people will urge you to do a study of your family system back into previous generations. And if you ever do that, by the way, you'll often, that study will often reveal dysfunctions that are not just individual in nature. They are what we call systemic. It is not unusual to find in the previous generations of sex abusers a history of such abuse. It's not unusual to find in the life of an alcoholic a story of multi-generational alcoholism. The disease is systemic and a family one. 
It's not unusual to discover within people who have such a hard time claiming their own space and worth a multitude, multi-generational pattern of such tr- struggle. Now, truthfully, this is particularly problematic for me because sometimes it's almost impossible. It seems almost impossible to help these individuals change. It's almost as if they have a tape in their brain and they cannot stop it, if you remember what tapes are. All right, I I know that's probably uh, something from the past. But it's almost as if you have a tape in your brain and you can't stop it and you can't unwind it. Even if these people are remarkably gifted, they cannot get away from the sense that at the bottom of it all, they aren't worth much. So I don't think it is totally helpful to abandon the sense that who, uh, who we are is deeply connected to the ones from whom we have come. We aren't islands unto ourselves. We are who we are in part because of what the, the DNA is that we have the functionality or dysfunctionality of those who have come before us. But Ezekiel does not want us to stop there to set up our house there. He doesn't want us to think that change isn't possible. God, through Ezekiel, says tonight, tomorrow, today, know that all lives are mine, the life of the parent as well as the child. That is to say that every life, Every generation belongs to God and thus has an accountability to God. Every generation, every life has worth in the sight of God, which is why God wants God's best for all generations and all people. What God wants for all of us is life. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Turn then and live. For those of you who have a notion about God, that God is at every turn ready to zap you, and you think that the Old Testament is replete with images supporting that view, you are wrong. God doesn't delight in people having a mess. God isn't sitting around ready to send a lightning bolt on you when you're naughty. What God wants for you individually and for us collectively is life. And true life, Ezekiel is saying, and actually Jesus is saying in Matthew today, comes through repentance. You know, so often you and I think that repentance is such bad news. Do I, as an individual, want to be vulnerable enough to say, I've messed up? Do we as baby boomers or World War II generational people, or millennials, or generational Xers want to be vulnerable enough to admit that there is much about our generations that need some cleaning up? Do we as a nation want to be vulnerable enough to say that sometimes we have failed, have made very serious mistakes? Often not. Honestly, We work so hard to make sure that we don't have to tell the truth. We run from the truth all the time. Which is what really is bad news. For, you see, hurt feelings aren't addressed without truth-telling. Alcoholics don't get better without truth-telling. Racism doesn't disappear without truth-telling. Damage to the environment doesn't get better without truth-telling. According to Ezekiel, truth-telling is not only possible, it is desirable because it is, it is in telling the truth that life can shine forth. Repentance is not death-dealing, it is life-giving. God takes, the ple- ple- takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. Repentance and change are possible. Now, I have to admit that as I have aged, I've become a little less confident about the possibility of change. Maybe I've become a little more cynical in my life. In my early life, I definitely was an idealist who worked very hard to bring about change. 
In college, I was a political science major who looked at the world with hopeful eyes, convinced that what was wrong about the world could give way to what could be right. Wars, pandemics, continuing signs of injustice, warmongering, and inequality have taken a toll on, my, on me. I found myself saying, Oh, the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. I think I need to stop saying that. It's not helping me. It's not helping the world I too often grieve over or the next generation who can be quick to give into despair. Life can be different. You can be different. I can be different. The world can be different. Repentance is possible. Racism can be addressed. The environment can be improved. Alcoholism can be treated. Self-hatred can be left behind. Women can be treated with dignity. Politics can become more civil and less shaped by money. We can think more communally and less individually. The vulnerable and the poor can be taken better care of. Issues around the police can be dealt with. Our health care system and how it is paid for can be improved. But all of this, all of this will not occur if we're not honest. If we don't stop hiding from the truth. If we abdicate our responsibility and our culpability. Listen to the words of Anathea Portier Young. I asked myself how my community and my generation have abdicated responsibility for our collective choices, adopting a pretense of powerlessness. It is easier to imagine that we can't do anything to change what appears to be broken. What a lack of faith. What a lack of imagination. God calls this church, this generation, this people to stop making excuses and stop hiding behind other people's mistakes. We are to turn our honest gaze on ourselves and repent now. Making life our ultimate value. When we live as if what is will always be, we act as if God is not living, but dead. The story of Jesus is a story that travels through death, but ends up in life. Resurrection is the end of of the story. Life is the goal, and life is what gets us there. Why would we want to die? Get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Turn and live. Amen. Take my life that I may be Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of my love. Take my feet and let them be such as beautiful for me. Take my life that I may be moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite will I withhold. Take my intellect and youth, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take 
Some announcements before we uh, turn to prayer. First of all, next weekend we start a whole new worship schedule, and this is pandemic related. We are going to begin services on Thursday night, not on Saturday night anymore, but Thursday night at 6.30. All of you are welcome to that. It will be the same service that we then have at 8.30 on Sunday morning or 10.30 on Sunday morning. And if possible, especially if you're going to uh, attend the 1030 service, we really want you to uh, sign up, that, uh, indicating that you're going to be present for that service. You can do that through the Eventbrite website or simply to call church and say, we're coming. Uh, and we just want to make sure that we manage this space with 60 people or less. So 630 Thursday. 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday. We will reevaluate this schedule at the end of the year and see if we want to go back to that Saturday night service. That's all possible. But for right now, this is how we're going to approach worship. This does enable us, by the way, having the Thursday night service enables Carl, who is our uh, digital guy here, to make sure that the video is uploaded uh, onto uh, Facebook and YouTube and enables him to do a little more uh, editing. Uh, otherwise, it's just right after this service, he, sent, he, he uh, uploads it, uh, and so this will give him some more time. We are starting a new Tuesday class. Not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. I'm calling it Living in Apocalyptic Days. Living in Apocalyptic Days. Uh, the Bible and Resilience. We're going to look at books like Revelation and Daniel, which are so badly misunderstood in the culture, and you see it on television all the time. But we will be talking about these books in their context, and we're going to ask, do they have something to say for days like this? And guess what? I think the answer is going to be yes. So you're welcome to join us. That is a Zoom experience. We have one more ex Zoom experience uh, Tuesday, 11 o'clock on the great thinkers. Our great thinker, the final class, and we've been doing this class for I don't know how many weeks, all right? Final class, we get to hear from Jesus. He is our big speaker on Tuesday. And we are going to start also a new Bible study. You know, we do a noon Bible study via Zoom on Thursday. Uh, and uh, we're going to add something. And the following week, I'm going to offer a Wednesday night study at 8.30, just prior to prayer at the end of the day. So if you join us for prayer at the end of the day uh, at 9 o'clock, which Paul and I do Sunday through Thursday, on Wednesday night, just for a half hour, we're going to look at a couple of the readings for the coming weekend. And not again, not this week, but we're starting uh, the following week. Faith formation, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I do. Thank you. This week, starting on Friday, our first faith formation class will be uploaded uh, for families and households to be able to access it. And this faith formation class is called Holy Moly. It is for four years old up till 
at any age, actually. But there will be activity packets available for households who have children ages four through fourth grade. I would encourage anyone to go on their website, www.firstlutheranmuskegon.org. If you go under the Learn tab at the top and push that, drop down, and you will see the children's faith formation classes starting to um, evolve on that. So Friday morning, you will be able to access the Sunday School lesson and your activity packet that you can pick up at church will be for four lessons, and you will have everything you need in that packet to do the activities at home. So we're really, really excited, and uh, we do hope that all the families will get involved in this. We do have some extra packets for those who are watching and would like to join us. Thank you. A couple of people announcements. Uh, Joe, I see you're here. Jan, still in the hospital? Jan Labiak in the hospital. We certainly are remembering her in prayer. And I ask you to remember Dolores uh, Brondike, whose uh, cancer is advancing. Please stand for prayer. Let us pray. Surrounded by the presence of God, let us come with humble hearts and a steadfast hope for the whole church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Holy and righteous God, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving for your inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Remind us of the freedom which comes from a repentant heart. Eliminate our fear of forgiveness so it is not based on our short-sighted idea of fairness, but on your abundant, unimaginable grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of creation, renew the face of the earth and inspire us with innovative ways to reduce and reverse pollution so future generations may also glean nourishment from the future harvest. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy and righteous God, place words of truth in the hearts of political, religious, and cultural leaders. Where inequity has taken root, bring justice. Where unrest resides, grant peace. And where forgiveness and reconciliation seem like distant dreams, bring the blessed assurance that your love and mercy are the templates for all generations. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for police officers, firefighters, emergency medical technicians, hospital staff, doctors, nurses, and home health care aides in our local communities and around the world. Grant them rest when they are weary and courage when despondent. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Compassionate Lord, deliver those in the depths of human sorrow, pain, and brokenness. Bring forth your healing power and compassion, and grant recovery to the addict, healing to the sick, hope to the brokenhearted, and renewal for those in despair. And remind us that we are all called to deepen our commitment to love tenderly, listen intently, and mirror the unlimited love of God. We pray especially for Dolores Brondike, Jan Labiak, Beth Bringadall, Sue Lathrop, Jim Neal, Deb Larson, Joan Beres, Renee Gelderloos, Bill Hunter, Mark Langlois, John and Kevin Dean. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of new life, we rejoice with the Long family as they celebrate the birth of their son, Daxon. Grant Todd and Carly wisdom and rest as, nurture and, as they nurture and care for this child. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And eternal God, comfort those who mourn. Pour out your compassion on those who have lost loved ones this week. May the family and friends of Dan Seymour, who is Mary Rapp's brother-in-law, 
Know what is without a shadow of a doubt the peace of your presence today and throughout the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting only in your mercy through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. This is a good time to get uh, your bread and wine uh, available for communion. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our delight that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ who overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Our Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and And the the glory glory forever forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is the body of Christ broken for you and for me. You may eat the bread. The blood of Christ is shed for you and for me. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Those of you gathered here, please stand for our final song, We Are Called.
Receive a Franciscan benediction. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, stay in peace, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.